I am chair of the Ann Arbor Energy Commission. Uh, and as chair, I'm calling this meeting to order at 6.02 p.m. on Tuesday, January 10th, 2023. Welcome everyone to the meeting. This is a virtual meeting to affect social distancing to mitigate the spread of the COVID-19 virus and other viruses, including the common flu, um, which are now having to deal with. Um, we will conduct this meeting like in-person meetings, commissioners during the roll call, please indicate your current location. Also during the meeting, please remain on camera just as you would be visible during in-person meetings. Finally, mute your microphone when not speaking. Public comment will be via telephone only. To speak during any of the two public comment opportunities, please call one of the following two toll-free numbers, 877-853-5247 or 888-788-0000. And enter the meeting ID 9568718 on your phone. This information is also available on the published agenda in the public uh, meeting notices section of the city's website and on the broadcast of this meeting on CTN channel. I believe it is, is it 19 tonight, Joe? Not 16? Or is that maybe the Environmental Commission that had a conflict? I can't remember. I am unsure. So okay. I think mean, it's still as normal. I think it's still 16. Okay. And 18G channel number nine and online at 18 or 82gov.org backslash watch CTN. Joe, if you could please read the land acknowledgement, that would be appreciated. Yep. Um, <clears throat> I acknowledge that the land of the city of Ann Arbor occupies is the ancestral, traditional, and contemporary lands of the Ashinaave and Wyandotte peoples. I further acknowledge that our city stands, like almost all property in the United States, on lands obtained, generally in unconscionable ways, from indigenous peoples. The taking of this land was formalized by the Treaty of Detroit in 1807. Knowing where we live, work, study, and recreate does not change the past, but a thorough understanding of the ongoing consequences of this past can empower us in our work to create a future that supports human flourishing and justice for all individuals. Thank you very much. Next uh, on the agenda is, um, well, first of all, uh, well, actually on the agenda is a roll call and then we do the agenda. Um, roll call, um, I have received in advance um, notices from um, Carleen Colin Garcia and from Commissioner Kerber that both are unable to attend tonight. Otherwise, it looks like we have a pretty good attendance. So Joe, if you would uh, take the roll call, that would be great. Yep, and a reminder, if you can state where you are calling in from uh, when you are saying present. Um, Commissioner Maycomer. Um, present and calling in from my home in Ann Arbor. Commissioner Levin. Here in Ann Arbor. Chair Mursky. Present calling from my home here in Ann Arbor. Uh, Vice Chair Colin Garcia is absent. Uh, Commissioner Bri or Council Member Briggs. Yeah, here in Ann Arbor. Uh, Council Member Radina. Here in Ann Arbor. Commissioner McCoy. Here in Ann Arbor. Commissioner Kerber is absent. Uh, Commissioner Overpeck. Happy New Year. Calling in from Ann Arbor. Commissioner Smith. Here from Ann Arbor. Commissioner Conan. Here and I'm calling in from Park Ridge, Illinois. Uh, Commissioner Zittleman. Here in Ann Arbor. Commissioner McKenna. Here, calling in from Ann Arbor. Commissioner Harp. Present, calling in from Ann Arbor. And Commissioner Berkowitz. Here from my home in Ann Arbor. Back to you, Chair. Uh, we have a quorum, correct? Yes, we do. Yeah, very good. 
So thanks very much. And I would like to echo Commissioner Overpeck's New Year's greetings. Hopefully everyone um, had a good holiday season and spent quality time with family and friends, or maybe just got away from it all. So uh, in any case, welcome back and uh, glad to see you all tonight. Uh, we have a uh, published agenda. Um, hopefully everybody's had a chance uh, to um, look at it. Uh, can um, I get a motion from someone um, to approve the agenda as written um, and then a second and then we'll open up for possible changes. Uh, moved by Commissioner McComber, seconded by anyone, C Commissioner McCoy. Um, any discussion or proposed changes? So seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye and or raise your hand. Aye. Passes unanimously, thank you. So um, next is approval of the minutes. Um, there were minutes of the meeting. I think it was officially a work session, but I still, still think it's worthwhile that we then um, approve those um, so that that's um, duly noted. Uh, as with the agenda, is there a motion to approve the minutes? Also from Commissioner McCumber, a second. Second from Council Member Adina. Um, any revisions or comments necessary? Seeing none, all those who favor approval of the minutes, please uh, raise your hand and say aye. Aye. All opposed? Oh, that was approved. That was uh, unanimous, so we don't have any uh, other votes. So the minutes are approved. Uh, the next is uh, public input. Um, and I will read my spiel. Um, this is an opportunity for persons to speak for up to three minutes. If you are watching on CTN, please call 888-788-0099 or 877-853-5247 and enter meeting ID 956-8718. 7876. This information is also displayed on the meeting agenda and the video feed. City staff will um, select callers that have raised their hand one by one using the last three digits of your phone number. To electronically raise your hand to indicate your desire to speak, please press star nine on your phone. You will hear an automated message that the host is allowing you to speak. When speaking, please move to a quiet area and mute any television or background sounds so that we may hear you clearly. And finally, please start by stating your name and address. All right, we have a couple. Um, you'll have three minutes to talk and I'll give you a 30 second warning uh, when we're 30 seconds out. Caller ending in 010. Caller ending and oh, Hello. There, okay, you're good. Hello, good evening. Uh, this is Wayne Appiard, a former member and chair of the Energy Commission for many years and a long time uh, green architect uh, who's been doing uh, solar stuff for 45 years. I wanna first congratulate the city and the cit its citizens for approving the climate millage. Having been pushing for more funding since well before we wrote the 2012 Climate Action Plan, it's great to see more adequate funding for this, uh, our most existential problem. I totally endorse the proposed reduction, a resolution on transparency, which although always important, becomes more so with the new millage funds and the ever increasing urgency of climate disruption. Especially with rapid growth, often comes chaos that allows money to not be spent well. Transparency involves communication with the community I do not think that there is currently enough. If you look at the city's website, many pages have information that is several years old and out of date. I'm also a bit concerned 
that the proposed allotment of the first year funding spends too much on items that do little to reduce our emissions. Time is running out. Funding should go where it's going to re create the largest reductions. I also and thoroughly enthusiastically endorse the proposed ban on the use of natural gas and new construction. As Ken Garber has shown, any new hookups commit us to building, commit buildings to decades of increased emissions. Natural gas is a health hazard, and the city should immediately institute at least a temporary ban on new apps new natural gas installations until the items that cause the postponement of the ordinance be, are flushed out. I hate to say negative things about uh, climate work at the city because it's probably the best in the state of, and, and high up in the country. However, we are in a crisis and things have to move fast. After reading the January OSI newsletter, I find that it appears that little improvement has little little movement has happened on HERD, the energy uh, home energy uh, rating disclosure, the green rental housing, and uh, the web portion of the energy concierge, concierge program. Um, when I was a member on the commission and for some time afterwards, we had subcommittees that worked seconds. on three projects. Um, so um, <clears throat> we need to move faster. Um, I, some of these appear to be stuck in, in legal, and I would uh, suggest that council needs to ask legal to move more quickly on these items. Um, it, it's, you're not, we're not moving fast enough. Uh, we need to do more. Thank you. Thank you. Um, caller ending in one, three, four. Thank you, Mr. Ling and Chair Mursky. It's Ken Garber, 28 Haber Hill Court. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to tonight's discussions of the climate millage budget, the transparency and accountability resolution, and gas and new construction. Um, a few comments on each. Uh, like Mr. Appleyard, I'm excited about the possibilities raised by the climate millage um, funding. Um, However, the slides show a large sum that could go to VPPAs or virtual power purchase agreements. While we should invest in new renewables as soon as we can, I'm very wary of VPPAs. With these deals, there is no physical transfer of electrons from generator to buyer. Rather, the buyer, in this case the city and its residents, guarantees a price to the generator over a period of time in exchange for renewable energy certificates or RECs. So VPPAs are electricity futures swaps, a kind of financial derivative, and almost all of them are done by for-profit companies. I can only find one municipal municipality that's executed one, Arlington County, Virginia. Um, besides the complexity and financial risk, with VPPAs, we still pay for dirty DTE electricity and support its fossil fuel generation. Better to use those funds to finance local generation and energy efficiency reducing demand for DTE power. Um, with the DTE landfill solar deal apparently dead, at least for now, let's instead gradually build it out under city ownership, taking advantage of the IRA's 30% direct payment to cities. Um, we can put in limited transmission to city facilities, starting with a line to the wastewater treatment plant, which uses almost 13 million kilowatt hours a year. I think this is at least worth discussing. Um, regarding the performance transparency resolution, this is badly needed. Um, I just looked at the city's performance measures webpage. As Mr. Appleyard just mentioned, the most recent data for public services are from 2019. Uh, for police, 2018. Community services, 2018. And frankly, it's almost all self-promoting PR fluff instead of real analysis. As taxpayers, we're entitled to the whole truth, including when we fall short of our goals. Uh, finally, on the gas ban, uh, we don't need a transition period. We just had one, seven all electric projects over two years, along with about two dozen projects using gas. 30 seconds. Anyway, yeah, anyway, gradual impl implementation makes perfect sense for other policy areas, but for climate, it's the wrong framing. 
Each time we approve a gas burning project, we're putting CO2 into the atmosphere for 50 years, where it remains for at least another 200, heating the planet. So it's not like we delay for a year or two and we're good. With every decision now, we're screwing the next 10 generations. Let's get an ordinance done so we can move on to the really hard stuff. That's time. Thank you. Any other callers? That is it. Okay. Thank you, callers, for your comments. So um, next on the agenda is uh, a reflection on 2022 Energy Commission work. Uh, so when Joel uh, and Carlene and I met, we thought uh, this was worthwhile, and we'd like this to be a little bit different focus than the work session that was held in December, where we talked about comment or our, our topics for 2023 and a little bit more about what went well in 2022, um, what could have done better, and using those lessons learned that hopefully we can capture tonight, we can do a better job in um, advising council and providing a, a forum for discussions on energy and greenhouse gas emissions here in the city of Ann Arbor. Uh, the commission is has as a primary function uh, the uh, role of advising city council and in particular our city council liaisons on energy and in, uh, greenhouse gas emissions related topics and so um, I thought what I would do first is ask Council Member Briggs and Council Member Adina to offer their reflections on 2022 and then open it up for the rest of the commission. So either one of you, if you'd be willing to go first, uh, that would be great. All right, well, I'll, I'll kick it off, I guess, then. Um, yeah, I think... Um, in terms of what I think was particularly helpful from kind of my role as liaison um, and the council's work. I think that obviously there were a number of different agenda items that got moved forward, but the the times where energy commission really dug into a subject, um, for example, and brought in some exer ex expert speakers um, and um, around the SEU and municipalization, um, I think that was really valuable, um, both in terms of bringing me up to speed, feeling like that we were really doing our due diligence um, as a commission and putting forward a recommendation to council, um, and then also being able to provide really strong resources to the community later on um, to be able to look at um, and dig into a subject. Um, I thought the um, the speakers uh, that were brought in about green building um, from other areas, that was really helpful. So. Um, that's personally, I think, what um, when I kind of think quickly back to, to 2022, it really pops out to me and um, what I would love to see us doing more in, in 2023 and beyond. So in quick response to that and to also guide everyone else's comments, um, the discussion on the SEU and all the aspects of that actually all took place in 2021, ending with a resolution that we passed in December of 2021. Um, but I think certainly the that year flew by, didn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it sure did. <laughs> so, um, but I think the, the general comment, and certainly the the one about buildings and our our uh, external uh, presenter on uh, green construction to McDonald, that was definitely something that was I think uh, positive this year. Um, anything else to add, uh, Council Member Briggs, or I'll let you chime back in at an appropriate time later if you want. Um, Council Member Redina, anything you'd like to share with us? Yeah, I, I started taking down a couple of notes from this, this item and um, made the same mistake as Erica because the uh, the SEU conversation was and, and the and the municipal energy conversation was I think actually such a really good example uh, of the commission diving in and bringing in experts from other communities and um, and I think also because council voted on that voted on the RFP midway through this year it was still fresh on our minds this year. Um, but I, I looked back a little bit and I think 
Um, I agree completely with Councilmember Briggs in in kind of the important role this body plays in educating me as a liaison and a, as a council member. Um, kind of the deeper dive that we get to take on some of the issues during the time in this meeting uh, makes it a lot easier for me when when issues come before for council itself and uh, provide me with I think a, a better perspective to talk to some of my colleagues when they have questions as well. And so I agree completely in kind of that bringing in issue area experts and doing some of the deeper dives into the issues facing the community. I think that's really helpful. Um, and I know uh, that sometimes I think particularly for those of you who are um, often bringing your own levels of expertise to this body, sometimes it can it can feel like these might be things that some of you already know or or you know you can chime in at times and add your own expertise as the expert is, that we've brought in is speaking. Um, but in your your role of advising counsel, I think that also demonstrates exactly why many of you are you know, around the screen. It's because you do have that expertise, um, but you're helping to provide advice and guidance to us, um, which I think is really helpful. Um, I looked back at just a few of the, the resolutions also that, that were passed this year, and um, I know that we, we discussed workforce housing, solar in installations, um, all electric appliances, green rental housing, um, home energy rating disclosure. And so I do think that there was some really substantial work that was happening over the last year. Um, and so I, I don't wanna lose sight of that as well. I think the education piece is important, but this group is also moving recommendations through to council, which I think are helpful as well. Um, and, and I think from that perspective, you know, encouraging weighing in on, on areas where we can continue to advance climate friendly policy and things like that is really helpful for my colleagues at the council table to hear as well. And so I think when there are those opportunities to weigh in, I think we've appreciated that. Um, and then I would just say the one thing that I think, you know, this isn't necessarily uh, specific to this group, but uh, because you are charged with, you know, energy and climate policy and other boards and commissions are charged with others. One of the things that I find with a lot of my commissions that I serve on is trying to, to also just keep in mind the bigger picture when we're doing some of this work. And there are times that we want to charge forward with something, but may also need to remember that, you know, it could have impact on housing policy or rental policy or environmental policy and, and just kind of making sure that we keep that broader uh, perspective so that we're not um, there are times I think Councilman Briggs and I find this quite a bit in, in our roles in different as different liaisons to different groups that at times we have a lot of competing priorities in the city and sometimes it's really easy for us to move things together um, in a really cohesive way and other times where there is tension and so trying to just keep in perspective that there are times that we may all feel really really passionately about something but have to acknowledge that that if we move something really quickly in one direction, it may slow something else down that's also been highlighted as a priority of the city and vice versa. And so just keeping that broad perspective. Um, and then the last thing I'll add is not necessarily a reflection of the work, but just something that I continue, I've noticed, and I think we brought up once before, and um, as it's that time of year, I think, where we might uh, have to renew our own bylaws and things like that. Um, this is the only body where as council members uh, that I serve on anyway, that as a council member, I do have a vote also, which I just think is a an interesting, I sometimes find it a bit challenging actually, because, because you guys are trying to provide advice to council, but I'm also voting on it at, at this table. And so it might be something to think about because it is, um, I, it, it adds kind of a different perspective when, when I have to vote on advising my colleagues. Um, it, it's not often that I want to, to shy away from being able to vote or say you should take some power away from me, but it, there's kind of a different responsibility that I have on this body than I have on different commissions throughout the city. So just something that I, I reflected on. Thank you very much for both of the, those perspectives. Uh, uh, Councilmember Adina, your last point was interesting to hear. I I serve as everybody knows as liaison to the Environmental Commission, and the council representatives have a vote there. And as far as I know, 
council member dish as liaison to the planning commission also has a vote on that commission i'm yeah, not I, sure I, I do think it's pretty i think it's pretty inconsistent throughout the group. yeah so it's it, it, it just something that i thought i'd bring up it is the only one that i'm on as right. an advisory commission that i have a vote interesting and i think interesting for for everybody amongst us uh i'd like to open things up um lessons learned um good and bad uh how can we improve uh what are your reactions to last year and i recognize that we have a number of relatively new members so it's going to be harder for you to to comment but hopefully you followed the work of the commission a little bit and have some opinions, um, even if they're relatively um, new um, based on your limited uh, participation. So open it up just for general comments and discussion. So seeing none, I'll offer a few of my own, and that might also spur some others' uh, thoughts on the matter. Um, I, I agree um, with both council members about um, the really positive things that have happened. Um, I think uh, we passed a number of resolutions uh, that were, I think, spurred a lot of conversation. Um, certainly among this group um, and also as mentioned by Councilmember Regina, also were considered by council and and passed the council and I think that's something that's really indicative of the kinds of things that we can do is to take on a subject as Councilmember Briggs said discuss it in detail or, uh, have that lead to a resolution and then hopefully have that result in in action um, in the, at the city council level. So I think that's that's really positive. Another thing that I found helpful um, is the presentation that we had from Washtenaw County on their climate action plan. And I think we see a, a direct connection um, between what we did in Ann Arbor and what the county is doing. Um, I think a lot of that is attributable to the work that this commission has done over the last couple of years and certainly also to the work that OSI did. Um, it just so happens that some of the lead consultants on the county's plan were um, consultants that Missy engaged for the A20 plan. And obviously that carried over. And I think there's also some good lessons learned um, in that plan. Um, one thing for me that was both a plus and maybe a minus is that we had presentations as mentioned earlier by those uh, who called in for public comment about the herd ordinance and also the green rental housing program um, proposed ordinance. Um, on the one hand, it was disappointing that um, those really still have yet to move forward. I think on the other hand, uh, given the option of not having those presented to the commission and not having the opportunity to weigh in, probably would have led to potentially even greater delays and bigger problems. And I think the, the fact that they were presented er, relatively early on, um, at least certainly with Green Rental Housing Program, heard has been in, in, in process, as most of you know, for two and a half, three years. Um, but certainly with Green Rental Housing Program, I think we raised um, during the meeting and then in a subsequent um, separate meeting, a lot of issues that were then able to be considered by staff. So I think, generally speaking, Joe, at least message for me is, you know, the, the earlier that things can be brought to the commission um, and be considered with the expertise, expert in, input of the commission, the better outputs that we're going to have in, in the long run. And then just uh, also to reflect, and I put these down independently before the meeting, um, I, I'm hoping that we can see progress accelerated on uh, our activities and that also accelerate activities on greenhouse gas emissions. And I also see um, legal as having been a historic bottleneck. And if this is indeed a, a climate and energy is indeed um, a, a crisis for the city and for us um, across you know, the United States and the globe, then 
I think we really need to think about how we can accelerate things through legal. It's been an issue ever since I've been involved with the Energy Commission since 2016. And it might be something that we need to talk about when we talk about climate millage funding, that more funding for climate goes specifically to legal resources. So th those are my thoughts. And I see that that uh, or uh, your own ruminations led to a couple of other ideas, uh, Commissioner McCoy and then Commissioner Overbeck. Yeah, similar to what others have said, I think um, I particularly appreciated the times that we've had presentations that are clearly linked to next steps, um, whether it be, you know, a draft of um, a resolution to pass or clear plans for follow-up discussions. Um, I think, you know, it's useful both to be able to get the information and, and use this space to do that, but then also to feel like we're serving a purpose of like carrying that information through. Um, and I feel like sometimes when we have presentations that it doesn't automatically lead to something like that, it can feel, it can get lost and hard to pick back up um, and also feel like it's unsure what, what the purpose of us having the presentation was. So I, I just wanted to emphasize that I, I really have found those useful and, and particularly when it's clear what we can do with the information next. Um, that, yeah, that was my main thing. Um, I had another thing and I, I can't remember it. So I'll raise my hand if I do. <laughs> Commissioner Peck. Yeah, I, I like all the comments we've had and including those from the public at the beginning. Um, I'd like to see us in 2023 really be more action oriented. And uh, so by the end of this year, we can really feel more tangible progress as a city in going carbon neutral and allocating resources in a way that really puts that number one uh, first and foremost. Uh, I don't think we should uh, bury our concern for adjust solutions in doing that, though. So we have to be a little careful on that front. And the other thing is, um, over the holidays, or since we last met, I had a chance to get to know uh, University of Michigan's new CFO, Chief Financial Officer, Jeff Chattis. He's the guy who's in charge of um, all our physical um, processes on campus and going carbon neutral. And he wants to uh, speed up the University of Michigan's carbon neutrality. Um, and he's really thinking big and outside the box uh, and ways to do that. Um, I mentioned it would be cool to see the university work better with the city. And he's enthusiastic about that as well. And if we wanted to have a session with him to hear his latest thoughts on what we're going to do, what we're doing at Michigan uh, University of, um, and how we might collaborate, you know, where we would all have probably some input on, you know, what could Mich University of Michigan do better to, in a collaborative spirit to move the needle faster. Um, I think we could talk them into it and uh, just need a, a good enough warning. Uh, I did follow up on uh, methane leakage and that uh, whole uh, debate has really got a lot of uncertainty, uh, but I would I will be on the record right already to say we got to get we got to ban natural gas. I mean, it's just that's the curse, and it's going to be there for a long time. As one of the uh, early commenters made uh, their comments focused on, uh, and I did follow up with Greg Keoli and two if we wanted to hear more. Uh, about the nuts and bolts of the different ideas that are coming out of Michigan sort of state of the art carbon neutrality ideas, mostly focused on uh, campus, but uh, increasingly we're trying to focus more on how can we speed things up um, in society in Mich you know in Ann Arbor could be a great way to test some of these ideas. Um, and the last thing that I still feel kind of like murky, um, and this might go to Ember's 
point about let's get, you know, um, see if we could ask for some really good presentation, some research is just, uh, I think we're still pretty um, unsure about how the federal money that's in the bipartisan infrastructure bill and the even bigger pot of money in the um, Inflation Reduction Act, how that money might uh, spark quicker change in Michigan and make sure that we are uh, surfing those waves as well in a, in a very uh, thought out way, well thought out way. Thanks. Thank you. Great, great input. Um, Commissioner M. Smith, and then back to Commissioner McCoy. Yes, thank you. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to kind of echo to two points. Um, first, just wanted to echo uh, Commissioner Overpeck uh, and C Commissioner McCoy's uh, uh, ideas on you know making um, uh, some of our discussions more actionable. And so kind of building off of that, if there's an opportunity similar to how we um, presented topics in our December working session of where you know we presented a kind of a clear object uh, objective, excuse me, for that topic. And then if there's, you know, an opportunity to be um, a bit more intentional about at the conclusion of that topic, discussion of next steps that lead to, you know, tangible actions, um, you know, whether it be gathering more information, you know, to ultimately build to a resolution or a recommendation, um, again, just to further support uh, the council in making some tangible um, progress here. Uh, and then my second point was uh, building off of uh, Commissioner, um, or excuse me, Council Member Radina's uh, comments on, you know, uh, ensuring that we're bringing in some broader context, recognizing that um, Environmental Commission, I understand we have a liaison position there, uh, but if there's an opportunity just to evaluate if there's other commissions of which we should have uh, stronger collaboration and connection with, I think also in the December working session, understanding that there's a lot of great discussion and progress being made on the Transportation Committee, for instance, and recognizing there's some strong synergies with some of the work that we're doing here, um, you know, maybe not every meeting, but think about what's that appropriate cadence to bring in some updates to understand where there could be closer um, collaboration to take advantage of, you know, uh, kind of identifying some synergistic opportunities to work together to make uh, some stronger recommendations here. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Good input. And I would suggest to all of us, myself included, that as we hear about these kinds of, uh, let's say, things that are happening in, in, in other commissions or in the community at large, where there may be conflicts, where there may be synergies, that we bring those up in um, topics for future uh, agendas, um, and also even bring them up as um, commissioner uh, updates um, or council updates. So um, don't, don't hesitate to use those opportunities in our, in our regular meeting agendas. Um, Commissioner McCoy and then Commissioner Levin. Yeah, the, the other thing that I was going to say is that um, uh, I think Queen Apple Art Yard mentioned how we had this year a handful of things passed through council that we had been working on for a long time, which is pretty exciting. Um, and, and on the flip side of that, we're still working on a handful of things that we have been for a long time, like the things you mentioned, Chair Mirsky, um, like around the rental ordinance and the housing ordinance and some of these concierge and, you know, even the natural gas ban we've now talked about for several meetings. And so it's not clear to me exactly where the bottlenecks are, like if they're, um, you know, there, there's not enough staff at OSI to work on some of these things, if they're things with the city lawyers, or if, you know, there could be places where, um, you know, people, those of us as commission members, you know, just need to help writing some of these resolutions out. And so, um, you know, similar to what others have said, I'm, I'm interested in, you know, not only working on new topics in this coming year, but also finding ways to push the things that we have been working on, you know, throughout this last year, or even the year prior, finally across um, to get to city council. Commissioner Levin. Uh, yeah, I, I would echo yeah a lot of the things people are saying with 
uh, trying to connect the presentations more with actionable items. And I do think there's just, yeah, just a general frustration with some things that have gotten slowed down for various reasons, either the legal department or some things in OSI or, that we didn't know exactly what was going on, but just, yeah, hopefully trying to, you know, as we are in this climate emergency to try to, as best we can, move some of these uh, items forward. And uh, the, the other thing, I, I believe uh, Commissioner Smith uh, touched on this as well, but I, I do also think um, coordinating with other commissions, particularly the Planning Commission, um, if that's gonna be one of the avenues that we're gonna use to uh, get some new regulations like the one we're talking about with uh, potentially uh, banning natural gas. I, I guess I don't fully follow how that flow happened. It seemed like it was an idea that we had for a while and then somehow it got to planning. And I know it's tricky with you know all these meetings that conflict. I think planning tends to have one at the same time as us. But that that um, that commission in general, I think, would be one to try to get a little bit better connection with. Thank you very much. Any other thoughts from anyone else? Uh, commissioner Hart. Thanks. Um, yeah, I, I I think I feel similarly as as well as some of the other commissioners, and and just a thought. Um, you know, trying, I do, I do very well when I can sort of see the horizon ahead and, and some of the items that we, we might be thinking about and working about and, and just thinking ahead to some of the, um, some of the topics for this next year. I'm just wondering about what capacity we might have to, to, um, identify the agenda sort of with a sort of further runway in advance, you know, at least either in, in sort of, um, uh, even tentatively um, to be able to sort of ally and, 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 and um, assemble, whether it's presentations or, or even, even coordination with other, other um, commissions and things like that. And so, you know, in a sense, trying to, trying to look ahead, whether it's six months or otherwise, just to get a sense of sort of what kinds of topics into the future we'll be, we'll be tackling and how we might begin to sort of bring a bit greater focus might be helpful to the work of this commission um, as well. And I, you know, and just just a last little point too, especially as we consider um, the climate millage and sort of relative priorities of, of that, um, and and what kinds of topics we might have to might need to address associated with that as well in the future. Great. They keep on coming. Anyone else? Yes, Councilmember Rodina. I have I have more of a question. Sorry, my camera. I I updated Zoom, and this has been happening all day. Um, so I uh, I had a question more for the group. I I've kind of heard from a couple of people about some frustration with with um, bottlenecks potentially in legal, and and I guess I was wondering if if there were some specific examples recently that I could point to, um, in large part because I. I I know that this has been a frustration on a couple of the commissions I'm on that are particularly interested in working towards ordinance changes and, and things like that and acknowledge that our legal staff is relatively limited um, in, in their staff resources as well and, and that they follow direction from council. And so I know that when commissions are asking for their time, often that does get put pushed back if council is directing them to do things instead. And so as I think about kind of processes and how we can make sure that as a government and as a system, we're functioning a little bit better. Are there specific frustrations that have bottled up because or that have come up? Because it may be something that that actually isn't the fault of legal staff, but rather simply the way we're structured currently. So I, I we don't have. Uh... Uh, Vice Chair Calvin Garcia, who's been on the commission for a long time, um, but two that come to mind uh, are the ED charging resolution that I think went back and forth to legal a couple of times, at least that's the way I recall it being portrayed, 
And certainly that's the case um, with HERD, uh, the Housing Energy Rating Disclosure. Uh, as mentioned, there was, um, I mean, I have a copy of what I would call an 80 to 90 percent finished res um, ordinance that's two and a half years old. And um, here we are um, hearing in the latest update that OSI sent out that it's um, still in legal or back in legal again. Um, so those are two that come to mind. Um, and I can give that some greater thought and um, give you some input. Um, and maybe it's just a, a legal budget that legal has that where they can go outside to uh, to, to use resources. I, I know that you need to cultivate who that resource is or what that resource is and what their competencies are and trust that that resource that Bob, that the relief valve, so to speak, um, when when the pressure internally is is uh, is so high that you need to go outside and, and relieve it. Um, but those are two that come to mind. Does anybody else, um, Commissioner McCumber, does anything? You've been on the commission for a long time. Does um, uh, Commissioner McCoy, um, anything else come to mind from your perspectives? And, and, and I will also acknowledge what you guys are thinking too, that you know the, the way that this works, even at the, the council level too, is it, everything that we would make, if there's gonna be an ordinance change, if, if something gets bounced around, if we rework a draft, it all has to go back through legal simply because I mean, we are, drafting laws and, and want to make sure that nothing's in conflict with other ordinance or with state law or and so so it can be a tedious process um so i i know that that can that can be slow as well um but but this is helpful as i think through kind of just system processes too thanks so i i encourage anyone that has thoughts on the matter to um, email our two council liaisons. Um, don't email the entire commission, um, but um, um, please provide that input, um, Commissioner Council Member um, Briggs, and then Commissioner McKenna. Yeah, and this is a reflection, sort of uh, similar to Council Member Rodinas, um, in terms of you know hearing a number of commissioners kind of talk about the frustration of well, what happens next with this. I do think um, it may be useful to. Um, build into this process um, around the table just um, as we as we hear updates maybe um, thinking about why thinking about why there there is a hold up um, council member Redina referenced this a little bit earlier though too in terms of sometimes what we find is there are some conflicting priorities or we have to wrestle with those in some sort of way and so um, certainly that's coming to a head right now, not only in our community, but all across the, the country and, and world, I suspect. Um, but, you know, we have to figure out as we, I, I suspect that um, as strongly as all of us feel around um, ban on, on gas, there's there's also the implication of one, we, needed, we need to make sure that if we make, that, make those steps that we're doing, um, we're being, um, doing our due diligence, making sure that, um, that we are in good legal grounding, legal, you know, legal ground, but also, um, you know, what are the implications if, if the implication of that would be that there is, n is no building in Ann Arbor um, of, of significant um, impact? What, what does that mean to our other goals on our housing work? Um, what is the impact of sustainability on affordability? Um, and I think that the more that we come back to this commission with those questions to wrestle through, um, there's a lot of expertise, <laughs> you know, more than probably any other commission that I'm on. Um, not only are there passionate people here, there's really very knowledgeable and, um, people around this table. And so I think you can bring additional um, insight to those, those issues that we're wrestling with. So um, just a small reflection on that. Commissioner McKenna. Thanks. I wanted to share um, on top of those really wise comments about uh, conflicting priorities that, um, you know, issues of jurisdiction and, and preemption with state law um, come to mind. I'm um, thinking specifically about natural gas ban in new construction um, and thinking about the work that I've done with the city of Boston and the state of Massachusetts. Um, and I know that that was a major issue there and we haven't gotten into the details yet um, with what's happening in, in Michigan, but um, 
you know, I think a pattern of what we see with climate change policy is that, you know, often cities have been taking the lead and have um, through the past five years plus have been finding issues with where exactly that jurisdiction lies. Um, and so that's that's kind of the large legal mess of, of figuring out climate action. Um, and, and I think all of us know that from working in the space, but I um, just kind of wanted to add that point. Last call for comments. Seeing no hands raised, um, Claire, other than yours, if you can take yours down, just so we know going forward, that it's not a new comment. Um, I'll, let's go ahead and move on to the next uh, point, which is um, a discussion on the millage um, and proposed spending um, in the millage. And Joe, if I may, I'd like to hand it over to you first, and then maybe um, have the council members comment and then open it up to further discussion. Yep, I will share my screen here um, and just run through a quick presentation overview uh, for people who are familiar, others who are not familiar, um, just going over quickly what already is in place. Um, Joe, Joe, by the way, is this posted to Legistar? Yeah, it should have been attached to the agenda. Okay, because it's not, uh, oh, it is, okay, it is, yep, underneath, yep, okay, now I see it, good, thanks. All right, um, so yeah, like I said, this will just be a, a quick run through of kind of what's already in there and where the process is at the moment and kind of the next steps. Um, for those who've kind of been following along, a lot of this is going to be pretty familiar just because a lot of it was prepared in preparation for people to understand what they were voting for. Um, so we're sticking as close to a lot of that as we could just because, again, that's what people um, voted on. Um, you can also check out more information at any time at www.a2gov.org slash 2022 Community Climate Action Millage, um, which has all the latest information uh, when we have it. Um, so on November 8th, 2022, Ann Arborites voted in support of passing a one mil 20 year millage to fund local climate action as outlined in a two zero plan. Since millages are based on property values, the amount generated from the millage will vary year to year, but it's estimated that the millage will generate approximately $7 million a year in 2022 dollars for the 20 year life of the millage. Um, like I said, in advance of the public vote, we put a bunch of materials together, including a proposed budget, uh, which can be found on that 2022 Community Climate Action website. Um, and you can see some, some more details on the different types of investments the city proposed making. Here's just a few of them. Um, there's, there's more in the entire document there. Um, so as we go through, I just want to kind of break out kind of what some of these things are and kind of share at a, at a high level what, what those terms mean and kind of where that, that uh, funding is going in the context of the A20 plan. Um, some of these will be more, you know, more energy related, others less so, but just to give the full overview of where things are going. Um, so to start with uh, strategy one in A20, which is about powering our grid with 100% renewable energy. Uh, so in the first two years of the millage, so fiscal year 24 and 25, um, we anticipate advancing this goal by providing direct incentives to residents and businesses for making investments in renewable energy. Uh, the incentives are being designed to stack with the Inflation Reduction Act to help more households invest in clean energy technologies such as solar and energy storage. Um, the specific amount of rebates per, you know, per household per business is still being determined. Um, but the goal is to help more households and businesses be able to take advantage of renewable energy to help uh, help us achieve our 100% carbon neutrality goal. Um, funding will also go to conducting any necessary studies, design work, and construction of renewable energy installations at public sites and in public spaces, uh, including at the Ann Arbor Housing Commission sites, which we have a goal of making net zero energy operations. Resources will also be dedicated to advancing the sustainable energy utility if it is enabled. Um, if that is not enabled by city council, the funds, at least for the first few years of the millage, will be reallocated to either direct residential and commercial incentives or to installing more renewables at city facilities. 
Um, and funding will be allocated to support renewable energy and storage installations at sites that are being turned into community resilience hubs, thereby ensuring these sites have power 24 seven and are able to continue providing their critical community services. For strategy two of A20, uh, this is supporting beneficial electrification. So here, the millage will support the installation of more public EV charging infrastructure, transitioning the city's fleet to all electric, and educational programs about the public health, safety, and general benefits of electrification. Additionally, in the first two years of the millage, we anticipate providing direct incentives to residents and businesses for making these beneficial electrification investments. Um, as I stated on the previous slide, these incentives will stack with the Inflation Reduction Act so we can help more households invest in things like cold climate, air source heat pumps, electric cooktops, and electric dryers, among others. Uh, again, the specific amount of these rebates per, you know, per household is still being determined, uh, but the intent is to help more folk be able to take advantage of beneficial electrification than are currently able. Strategy three of A20 focuses on energy efficiency or energy waste reduction. Uh, so here, the proposed millage budget will support incentives and rebates for energy efficiency initiatives in homes and businesses. Again, similar to the first two categories, these incentives and rebates will be aligned with the Inflation Reduction Act to uh, help residents and businesses further in their energy efficiency retrofits. Um, these programs will also include support for renters and landlords um, and a special low income sustainability grant program that will help offset the cost of sustainability improvements from some of our most vulnerable residents. Uh, once again, the specifics here are currently being determined. Um, funding will also be allocated to expand weatherization services, meaning that Ann Arbor residents eligible for weatherization support will get more funding to help their improvements go deeper. Uh, there are also dollars allocated to expanding and growing our Aging in Place Efficiently program uh, to help income qualified older adults age in a place of their choosing for longer. We've also allocated funding to sustain a people person focused energy concierge, um, which, um, as we talked about last session, we're current we're piloting this spring. And of course, there's general um, education dollars available to ensure that folk are aware of and able to engage in uh, these newly created or enhanced programs through the millage. Strategy four of A20 focuses on uh, reducing the miles of travel in our vehicles by 50%. In the plan itself, a lot of the actions focus on transit, which is not the purpose of the community climate action millage itself. Um, instead, the millage will the millage funding for the strategy will invest in expanding, creating, and sustaining the city's non-motorized transportation networks through making investments in protected bike lanes and support of citywide bike infrastructure, upgrading and increasing the number of crosswalks to ensure safe and viable pathways for pedestrians, installing streetlights at all uncontrolled crosswalks to ensure they're properly lit and launching a bicycle discount program. Strategy five of A20 focuses on moving towards a more circular economy. Uh, so in this area, during the first few years, the millage will support comprehensive compost and recycling services throughout the city, including for commercial and multifamily units, uh, which is something the city has wanted to do for a while, but has lacked the sustained resources to implement. Funding will also be allocated to support construction waste recovery and diversion programs, the enhancement of existing and the launch of new reuse programs and services, and enhancement to refrigerant recycling and replacement programs. Additionally, funding will go towards enhancing knowledge and the use of sustainable food throughout the community, including at city facilities and events. Uh, the sixth strategy of A20 is resilience. Uh, in this area, the millage will support the creation of neighborhood resilience centers slash hubs, ideally in every ward of the city. Millage resources will also support neighborhood emergency preparedness activities, including neighborhood asset mapping, resource sharing, and community building. Resources will also be allocated to build out a robust heat and flood monitoring system and to install and maintain green infrastructure, such as trees and rain gardens in underserved or vulnerable areas. The final category of proposed uses is around capacity building. Uh, so here we propose resources to support general public engagement and education, administrative and ancillary costs to operate all the programs and services we talked about, as well as some dollars for external professional service assistance. Uh, this also includes matching funds for funding proposals, such as the AmeriCorps program or the U.S. Department of Energy's various proposals. In terms of next step, um, this slide details just kind of how the city budgeting process works for those who are unfamiliar. Um, we're currently finalizing the details of our budget this month uh, so that it can go to the city administrator uh, towards the end of January. 
uh, during the months of February and March, we'll be in discussions with city council. In April, the final full city budget as determined by the city administrator is presented to city council. And in May, council votes on the budget. And then on July 1st, 2023, the adopted budget begins. So that was a lot of things really quick in a short period of time. Um, so, but just want to let you all know that and kind of set the context for uh, more discussion here. Um, again, you can always see more on our website, www.a2gov.org 2022 Community Climate Action Millage. Um, look forward to now answering uh, questions that I can and taking all of your input and advice on how we can uh, direct these funds to most deeply impact Ann Arbor and our carbon neutrality goals in the coming years. Thank you very much, Joe. Uh, before I open it up, I'd like to uh, give an opportunity to our two council members to add anything uh, or comment on anything Joe presented. Um, if you don't have anything, then we'll just open it up for general discussion. Okay. Um, other commissioners, thoughts on the millage, on millage spending, priorities, advice to our council member liaisons and to council more generally? What are your thoughts? Commissioner Peck. Thank you. Uh, I wonder if it would be good to just go through those at some point um, and Joe could do it perhaps uh, when others could chime in, you know, where do you need our help on any of them? Uh, and if you don't need our help on them, uh, we could focus on other uh, initiatives. In other words, uh, one, uh, one way to look at it, this is wonderful that we have the millage, wonderful it's well thought out and planned and um, all, all kudos to everybody who's involved, but it's not enough to go carbon neutral by 2030. Uh, so we need to do some bigger things, uh, probably, if we're going to achieve that. And maybe this commission should be focused on the complementary uh, and hopefully bigger things that would help us get to that goal um, faster. Thank you. Yeah, just to just to chime in from my own perspective, um, you know, like you said, and also like uh, this is going at the end of January to, to uh, the administrator. So and it was presented to the voters before voting. So there's not a ton of flex of what's already in there. Um, but again, just kind of saying like, yes, this makes sense. Again, there's opportunities to adjust down the line. Um, so, you know, as we see things as they're going, if there's room there, um, but like you said, always open to hearing kind of what what additional steps there are because the end of the day seven million is a lot but it's not a lot in the sense of <laughs> here's how much can be solved in seven years now so commissioner levin and then commissioner Harvard. uh yeah i just had a quick question about the uh, incentives or, or rebates what have you um is, is there an income component to that or is it going to be open to all residents yeah we're working through all the details um but the anticipation is that there will be um kind of similar to the way the um inflation reduction act is structured well there'll be, there'll be portions that are generally available to everyone um, with additional incentives available to those with lower incomes um that way to kind of have a more equitable distribution uh, while also realizing that you know even for people who are in certain areas some of these um some of these things can still be a little expensive. So having those extra funds can still be helpful in pushing towards that change. Thanks. Thanks. Um, that was great. That was, the description was super helpful as well. And, and I think my question was just about um, what's guiding the sort of priorities among this list right now and whether sort of each of those areas, whether it's renewable energy or, or some of the sub items underneath, um, sort of where are you at in terms of the priorities? And then I think, as you mentioned, a number of them are, are aligned, for example, with the Inflation Reduction Act. A number of them are about reducing vulnerabilities that that might that already exist. And so it, if, is there some existing thinking about that in terms of both in terms of budget priorities, but also implementation priorities about where you're at with that? 
Sure. Um, I can't speak necessarily to all of where the prioritization came from, just because that was still slightly before uh, when I when I started here. But I know a lot of it, again, was kind of based on where we can, you know, kind of start making some of those changes, where we have the ability to just start making some of those changes um, and kind of where we have current funding gaps. Um, you know, some things we can kind of fill with different uh, grants, for instance, um, but there there just happens to be more grant funding in a certain area while less in another. Um, so kind of just start, starting to prioritize by where having those funds would make the biggest impact from day one, because, you know, some of the some of those funds will be, you know, they'll be al allocated for a certain year and they have to be spent in that year. Um, so if you kind of put something in there that might not have the ability to take place in that year, you can you know, it's hard to use the the funds in that to that capacity. Um, so I think that that's where some of it was. Um, again, a lot of it was based around A20, what we heard um, from different uh, feedback sessions, both in the creation of A20 itself, um, as well as over the subsequent years, um, and seeing where we could go with some of our different partners who kind of work on these different er areas, hearing uh, what what would help help them and or help advance their goals kind of in that area, help advance our goals in that area and kind of in that mutual way. Um, and then can you say your second question again? Sorry. I, I think, you know, part of what I was alluding to is there, some of these items are aligned with other programs that are rolling out. So for example, the Inflation Reduction Act, and, and there's obviously some simultaneous co-benefits that have to do with aligning some of these programs around that um, in terms of the timing of when the incentives and things like that are going to happen. So it's just a question about whether, I think, whether or not um, how that how that's influencing the relative priorities of of these items or if there might be other areas as well sure um so yeah for you know just to talk about like the incentives rebates um that we're kind of talking about for different things like around electrification renewable energy energy efficiency things like that um as we've kind of talked about a little bit here as well as in in our our last meeting um a lot of the stuff on the inflation reduct is kind of unclear at the moment of like when exactly it will take place. We have a better idea with some of the um, tax incentives uh, that they'll be taking place for 2023. Um, but with the rebates, we don't exactly know when it's going to be happening. Um, but we also know that like action needs to take place now. Um, and especially when you get into some of these appliances that uh, people traditionally kind of just replace at time of use, um, you know, talk, talk about your furnaces, your air conditioners, um, vast majority of people, you replace it when you need a new one. You know, you're not sitting there being like, well, I've, I'm ready to make this upgrade. So I'm going to do it now, even though I got five, 10 years left of, on this appliance. Um, so we really want to get things out there as soon as we can. Um, so that way, even if some of those rebates aren't available through the IRA, um, there's something in place so that people who, you know, say they're not entirely relying on the, you know, the IRA rebates, things like that, um, but they just need that little push to kind of get going are still able to do that. Or again, if they're in the spot where, you know, my furnace dies in, you know, this upcoming, you know, September, October, November, and you're like, I, I don't want to be cold this winter. Um, <laughs> so I need to make something now. There's at least something there, even if there's not yet those structures in place. Um, but at the same time, once those all come in, then everything's compounded. We can get more and more people into it. Potential um, also already having some people who are familiar with what's kind of going on. So they're more receptive to now there's also this and also getting those um, signals out there to contractors, manufacturers, things like that to really start uh, pushing these changes as we go. So we want to have something out there as soon as we possibly can, even if IRA and other things like that aren't ready, um, but really combining them once everything is. Commissioner Smith. Uh, yeah, you may have just answered my question in part, Joe, but I was just curious, um, you know, building off of the question, understanding that some of the priorities are based off of A20, but have also been reimagined given some of the challenges uh, that you all have experienced. Is there a clear action plan or timeline associated with some of the, the initiatives that you mentioned? Um, understanding some of it may be in progress, um, but is that something that you could share uh, with the, the commission, uh, if not now in the, the future? Yeah, we will definitely, um, you know, talk more as some of these things are more are more finalized. Um, for instance, the, you know, incentives, rebates, things like that. Um, you know, it'll need to be ready by the time everything comes out. Um, we've been talking, or we've been starting to talk with a couple of different communities who have different um, of those like incentive and rebate structures in place to see kind of like what systems, processes, 
you know, how working through that has worked best for them. Um, so that's happening later this month, uh, a little bit in February. Um, so as of right now, it's kind of, again, starting to work through uh, some of those things to get them ready by the time it, it all it all comes forward. And as those are, are finalized, definitely would be happy to kind of come back, talk more about it. Um, if there's any other specifics, you know, feel free to uh, if, or if there's anything specific I can answer now, I'd be happy to answer now, but some I might have to just check back in to see with like who's specifically working on what portion, 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 excuse me, of it. Um, any other comments or advice? So as I've done previously, I'll share some of my own and um, hope that others um, either respond to those or come up with um, other ideas. I have one specific question and then a couple of general uh, suggestions for consideration for our council member liaisons. Um, the plan, the meaning the A20 plan, mentions bulk buy programs um, for a number of different, let's say, um, devices or appliances, uh, specific um, kitchen appliances, uh, HVAC systems, EVs. You, we talked about some incentives um, that would align with IRA. Um, are any of these gonna be coupled with bulk buys in the kind of sense that we have with the Solarize program, where uh, if you are able, we are able to bundle a number of people going solar, then we're reducing the cost of sales to the solar installer. And the solar installer is passing on that cost of sale reduction or expense reduction that um, that it is seeing to the solarized customers. Is there anything like that in 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 let's say in the planning and that could be reviewed by the commission? before it's launched in the community. Yeah, um, I I know there's some like early thoughts of that in like a couple, like we've had a couple um, communities within Ann Arbor that have reached out that are thinking about doing that. Um, so we're starting to talk with them to kind of see, you know, how that would work, uh, talking with like installers, manufacturers, um, how it would work for them. Um, Cause you know, some of them can be a little, it can get a little bit different in some of the stuff, you know, such as heat pumps where like, you know, it's not ne every home doesn't necessarily have the exact same system put in place, um, but you still have the scale. Uh, so kind of just trying to see some of that. Um, I don't know if there's specific funding within this, like directly for setting up a program like that, obviously having the incentives and rebates kind of help. So even if you're not in a system like that, you're still saving on it. Um, but yeah, some early work has been done looking into um, a program like that to kind of see how it works, see kind of uh, what we can learn from that, uh, depending, you know, how how that would go, um, starting to think or starting to set up more and more like that at, on a on a broader scale. So from my business background, particularly for products that are sort of emerging in the market, um, one of their significant costs are sales costs, attracting customers, convincing them, getting them over. And what we're doing um, through our programs through the city is really helping them on reducing their cost of sales. And um, if we can do that, um, then we can pass, like I said, those savings on um, in addition to using monies from the millage to provide further rebates and incentives. So if we can couple the two of those together, we're going to get a double benefit for those in Ann Arbor that are relatively early adopters. I'll let uh, Commissioner McKenna respond to that. Thank you so much, Chair and Mercy. I just wanted to make a couple of comments. Um, in this space, I think uh, first it's a little bit more difficult to have a uh, group buy um, with heat pumps, let's say, or any kind of home appliance compared to solar because it's, um, like Joe mentioned, these are not optional kind of uh, appliance changes, like uh, households would mostly only opt into them because their current system is failing or kind of at risk of failing. So that's that kind of shrinks the opportunity uh, at the outset. And at the same time, there's a huge need for contractor training and workforce training. Um, and I didn't hear anything about that, um, you know, in, the, in Joe's presentation, but I'd like to um, kind of post that up 
say that I'm, I'm, I'm wondering what the focus is there. Um, that, that may not be city, money that comes directly from the city, but I think partnerships with the unions and with the on um, the you know groups that we do have um, both organizationally and um, you know the businesses locally that can do this work, uh, whether it's you know install um, heat pumps or do um, you know air sealing that kind of stuff. Um, just want to hear a little bit more about that if we have time. Uh, otherwise, we can kind of talk about it later. Yeah, um, I'll say it's something where, as well as pretty much everyone in this space is thinking more and more about and have been thinking more and more about for a few you know years now, because we we do know it, it's a thing. There's not necessarily enough contractors in place um, to do everything at once. Um, that just wouldn't be efficient for them either. Um, but yeah, we're definitely working more and more on it. Uh, we have several of the local trade unions are um, A to zero collaborators. So we do have existing relationships with them, have been talking with them um, and, are, and are moving further into uh, those conversations. Uh, to see what kind of can be done, um, what you know, what is the role of us as a local government for that? Um, which a lot of the things we've read is, you know, having things like these different incentive structures um, and things in place, kind of sending those market signals out is one of those big um, areas where we can have a role. Um, but also starting to communicate uh, again with you know places like that, uh, trade schools apprenticeship um, opportunities um, to kind of be figuring out where that at. So even if there's not necessarily in the millage itself, it is a thing we're spending staff time on thinking about. Um, also with our work with Michigan Saves, um, the state green bank, they're doing a lot of it. Um, we're having a lot more conversations with them about their electrification badge program um, and other things of that nature that's also pushing forward from, again, another entity outside of the city, but someone we're working with um, as the city. Mr. McKenna, do you have another comment or? Yeah, quick follow up comment. Um, this may be an opportunity for a working group. I don't know if any others are interested, but I'm, I'm super interested and also was kind of skilled in the workforce area. So Joe, just uh, take note that um, if, the, if it kind of does come to that, um, I'd be happy to participate um, and kind of supplement. Thanks. So I mentioned I had a couple of other general comments um, for in particular. Um, the A20 plan has uh, in the very beginning, somewhere like on page 11 and 12 or something like that, a summary of all the actions. Um, it includes um, a cost to implement and an estimate of CO2, tons of CO2 equivalent reduced, and then a dollar per ton of CO2 is sort of efficiency measure. Um, I would strongly urge council as you review um, the proposed spending, to make sure that spending is tied to those actions that have the best return on investment. Um, it's likely that some of the actions that don't have a very good return right now as technology changes and things like that, that we can um, shift to those later on in the plan. Um, but spending a lot of money now on maybe a technology that's not yet ripe to me doesn't make a whole lot of sense, especially if there's low hanging fruit, energy efficiency being one example. Um, I'll um, cite two examples, um, or just maybe just one general example from the solid waste area. Um, the two of the suggestions in the solid waste area had costs roughly a thousand to 10,000 times higher per metric ton of CO2 redu reduction than many of the other actions. Those calculations may not be accurate. They may have been based on, on bad assumptions at the time, but if they are even close to being accurate, even if they're 50% off, it seems to me that we should be um, re-looking at those and focusing on the low hanging fruits early, especially because we know that um, the area under the emissions curve is really important here. And so doing the things that are really easy, that give us a big bang to the buck, are really the things that we should be doing. Um, secondly, um, I would hope that there's also, and this is related to the first, that there's a clear line of sight between money being spent in actions and those actions really leading to clear benefits to the community 
ideally in the case of energy and climate reduction, um, it seems to me that there may be things in the plan that are great in terms of a benefit to the community, but are not necessarily tied to climate action. And I would say one of the things that council should be looking for is when we're looking at spending, whether or not spending should be coming out of the climate millage or whether it should be coming out of another part of the budget that more ties to that particular area. And as an example, um, and, and I don't know what kinds of means testing will be done, for example, for aging in place, it's, it's in the plan, um, but some of the things that I think we need to be careful that we're not doing is, for example, um, providing incentives for um, an elderly person who's in a 3,000 square foot house, um, and, and there's one person in that house where they raised you know, four children in that house 20, 30 years ago, and we're providing incentives for that person to stay in that household as opposed to providing that money for something that to me has a, a, a more direct benefit on, on climate action. And then the last thing that I would ask is that when the budget is presented in March, that council ask for a summary of specific climate spending and what the actions are and what the outcomes are tied to. So that this is not buried in 50 different line items um, in, that's scattered throughout the budget, but there's no, no sense anymore. And that will certainly decline over time if we don't adopt this practice of what are we spending money on? How does it, where is the source? And what kind of outcomes is it actually gonna be delivered? So those are my general requests of council as you approve this money um, so that we really see true benefits um, in terms of energy reduction, greenhouse gas emission, and let's say resiliency kind of mat things that really matter and are tied to, to climate issues. Council member, excuse me, Commissioner Peck. Yeah, I think you did a wonderful job, John, uh, of sort of saying what the articulating what I think a bunch of us are thinking, uh, hopefully at least me. Uh, and I would love to see also a real clear art, uh, analysis and articulation of how our choices in spending that money uh, for the best bang for the buck with re in terms of carbon reduction per dollar, uh, also leverage other monies uh, that are and policies, you know, because one thing we also need to get at is how is the, the new majority in the state house uh, going to hopefully improve the situation uh, in some tangible ways for carbon uh, reductions. And lastly, um, maybe one of the things we got to, you know, we still need to have that conversation of, of metrics and accountability, but we really need to design that way that the city is uh, being transparent and revealing how much carbon is being reduced per dollar. We really need to be tracking that in a way that's really crystal clear um, and broken down by various uh, approaches so that we could start to see uh, where money is maybe not being well used when it comes to carbon reduction. Um, and your point is a good one in the sense that, uh, you know, five years from now, some of the things that are uh, not cost effective now will be much more cost effective. Um, and it really does pay to sequence these things carefully. So just this is a, my way of saying good job. <laughs> Thank you. Others? So I assume that we will probably come back to this topic, especially maybe in the March, April timeframe, as the budget is assembled and presented to the public um, and before it is uh, approved um, or goes to uh, council for approval in May. Um, I think it's um, the first, um, what is it, 
the two meetings in May, subsequent meetings in May, where the budget is considered and then, then approved. So hopefully we'll have a chance to weigh in with any more specifics that anybody has uh, in the coming months. We still have two pretty consequential um, agenda items that might take some time. So um, unless there's anybody else that has any final thoughts, um, I'll wait a second or two. Yes, Council Member Briggs. Yeah, I think, um, thanks, just real briefly. I think, um, as you mentioned, this is gonna come back to this commission, um, the budget um, discussion prior to going to council. And I think the, you know, so the request that you made um, and the commissioner Overpeck made as well, I think that's really helpful if this, if that, if it comes very clearly to this commission, how the, how the funding, um, obviously certain things have been promised to the voters right now. And those things were promised um, because of our, I assume staff's understanding of how we could leverage dollars the best right now and have the most impact. Um, that's how I presume those, those um, decisions were made. And so just, but being prepared to come to the commission with um, kind of a full presentation on that, on those items and um, kind of the impacts, I think will be helpful to get the, feedback and buy-in hopefully of this commission so that when it comes to council, we can feel really um, secure in knowing that when we're voting on this issue, it's really been weighed in um, and um, gotten the, um, the support of this commission. Great, thank you. So the next uh, point on the agenda is uh, a resolution to improve transparency of city of Ann Arbor um, performance. Um, I hope that all of you have had a chance to do two things. First of all, um, skim through the draft resolution. And secondly, to read the email that Joe sent out. I tried to send it out, but as he mentioned, I had email issues, so I couldn't send it out last week. And Joe was out for a couple of days um, last week. So unfortunately, it just got in your hands um, today, I guess it was, right? Um, so uh, what I'd like to do is just maybe mention a couple of things. Um, and some of these are, I would say, stated in, in more or less general terms in the whereas clauses of uh, the resolution. Um, so First of all, I think um, good performance metrics, their tracking and their reporting is really fundamental to efficient and effective work, to continuous improvement and to policy and decision making. Um, and then also just in generally um, participatory government and, and governance. And so that is really the idea behind um, the resolution. Um, the resolution was something that I drafted in early 2022. I shared it with a city administrator um, in March, got feedback from him in April, asking that I delay action on it until September. Um, I reached out to him in September. Uh, I didn't hear back from him. And so what, what, what has been done and what's reflected in the email is that um, I introduced this through the energy or excuse me, through the environmental commission. And in the September and October meetings, um, it was considered and was approved in the October meeting um, by a nine to two margin. Um, rather than me rambling on a lot, what I thought maybe I would do is just simply um, ask for a motion to consider uh, the resolution and a second, after which we would open it up for discussion. Um, the intent would be that if this moves to that point, that this would just be a discussion and essentially a first reading of the resolution. And then if it had some level of support, then this would be considered in a future meeting, potentially in February or March. Um, but I thought um, the best thing to do is, is just uh, make sure that uh, we have at least uh, a, a motion that the commission agrees on that it should be uh, 
considered for discussion. So um, can I get a motion to consider um, the proposed resolution in a second, um, and then we'll vote on it, and then we'll have open it up for discussion. So I have um, a motion from Commissioner McCoy and a second from Commissioner um, Kennan uh, and or McCumber. Um, so um, we have uh, um, the motions on, on the table now for consideration. I, I don't think I need to take a vote on this, right? We just have two motions for consideration. So um, what I'd like to do now is just uh, open it up for, for discussion and for comments. And I, I, those can be also questions. There, this has a long history. Um, I discussed this with um, um, Carlene um, and um, as I mentioned, this went through the Environmental Commission. So I've had a lot of discussions um, with the chair and the vice chair of that commission, as well as with um, the two council members that were liaisons um, to that commission at the time. Um, and I can share that with you as appropriate. So go ahead, um, council member Redeem. Thanks, Chair Marcian, for that background as well. Um, Without getting necessarily into the substance of the resolution itself, I have a few comments I would say maybe on um, framing and process that that drew my attention as I was reading through it. Um, I, I am particularly, I guess, concerned. I think with with some of the 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 language in the resolved clauses itself, simply because as an advisory body the commission can't really direct the city administrator um and so the the city administrator shall language and things like that is i think process probably a little out of out of the norm for a, one of our advisory commissions um i would be much more comfortable if this was uh framed in a way that was advising city council on on policy um and then I guess I would also just request as we're having the conversation, I think there are a few areas where we could potentially frame this in a more constructive feedback way, it, particularly, I, I would like to avoid any um, critique of or characterization of staff work in here. And so I'm, I'm particularly referring to the uh, the one that drew my attention, whereas the performance measures web page is generally both poorly executed and maintained. Um, I would like to rework some of that language in order to make it yeah, more positive in the framing of what we would like to see in a constructive way, rather than kind of a critique of what exists today, because I also want to acknowledge that we are undergoing kind of a, a, a re, re framing or a, a redo of our website and everything. And so there may be many reasons why some of our website is clunky. We, we have, as a city have acknowledged that and are working towards completely revamping the website. And so I would like us to avoid some of those characterizations of staff work if possible. Um, and so that, that doesn't necessarily get into the substance, but kind of my feeling on, on the resolution itself is I think we we as a body probably need to do a little bit more work on it to get it more in line with what I think an advisory commission should probably be pushing out. If I can respond to those before allowing council member Briggs to comment, uh, the version that was posted to Legistar was the original version with a lot of whereas clauses that provided additional background information. Um, we got similar feedback from the Environmental Commission. Um, many of those whereas clauses that you called into question were ultimately uh, eliminated from the version passed by the Environmental Commission. Um, I think that's reflected in the version that was sent out uh, to um, all of you um, from Joe um, in his email. Um, in addition, um, I, I sent a or I had Joe send a link to the one the resolution as it appears in Legistar um, as passed by the um, Environmental Commission, but I have another version. Um, so that 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 is the official record in Legistar of what was discussed. But what I have is another version that addresses some of the questions that you raised about 
the commission directing the administrator and the the language was changed in in this version that I can share with the commission saying resolved that the environmental commission recommends that city council do such and such so that that addressed both of both at least to some degree both of your points and there may be other more specifics that need to be taken into into account um council member briggs if you're still there um go ahead with your comments yeah thanks yeah i turned off my screen because i'm having some internet um connection issues right now but um i uh definitely agree with um sort of uh council member radina's thoughts on this um I also, in terms of if, as we're reworking it, um, I personally think it might be more helpful to more narrowly tailor this to um, performance metrics um, that would be helpful from, from the perspective of Energy Commission um, and looking at um, sort of our, our energy work in the city. So um, I have certainly have thoughts as well around improving our performance, performance metrics and um, making being much more transparent and accessible with that data and I think it's necessary for for all aspects of the work that we're doing in the city and um, Councilmember Rodina spoke to one of the issues around um, uh, the website being redone but there are there are a host of other issues as well in terms of conversations that I've had with the, the city administrator around this but um, so I, I guess I would hope that we might um, more narrowly tailor this in a way that would be perhaps a good model for um, thinking about it um, kind of across different units of, of the organization. And obviously energy touches a number of different units. And so um, it would likely be a little broader um, for that reason, um, but that would be, be my recommendation. Thank you like to open things up. Um, specific concerns or uh, comments, uh, questions, um, any general thoughts on the matter? Uh, Commissioner Smith. Hey, thank you. Um, yes, a, a couple. Um, uh, also would like to think about how to be a bit more specific um, in terms of uh, what we see. I noticed uh, in the resolution as drafted, um, there's a number of best practice dashboards that are referenced. If there's specific elements of those dashboards that we could pull out that we think that uh, represent those, those best practices, um, I think that may be uh, beneficial um, in our recommendations here. And I, you know, uh, offer to, you know, take that review and, and provide some thoughts there. Um, also, I'd like to, you know, um, ask that we can consider the timeline in which this dashboard is being updated. Um, I think a year is a, a good start, but I think it's a start due to the nature of the crisis that we're under. Hopefully that this dashboard is something that is simple enough um, that we could update as frequent as a quarterly basis um, here and just would like for us to consider what uh, time frame is, is reasonable. If I can just respond to those, um, I, I share your thoughts. Um, because this was written generally, um, it was uh, the idea was annual would be a place to start. Um, but I agree completely. In some cases, more frequent updates absolutely make sense. In other cases, um, some data isn't really even generated until the end of the year. I mean, we, we know from the greenhouse gas inventory, for example, that we don't get data from DTE until the end of the year. That doesn't mean at some point it wouldn't be possible to get more frequently, but right now some 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 of these things can only be updated annually. So um, I, I, I think th those are great points. Um, just as far as your first point is concerned, um, I think the main thing that is um, to some degree called out in the whereas clauses is that performance transparency provides context. So um, rather than just a data point, um, the, the, the context is how does that data point compare to previous uh, performance? So basically trending the performance, it provides context to um, smart goals that have been set, for example, by city council. Um, it provides context to how peers are performing, so if we're saying that we want to do X, 
but there we know that already a bunch of other um, peer cities are doing much better or much worse, then it calls into question what our goals are. So context is just sort of a, a general thing. And all of the better dashboards do exactly that. They trend chart, they show goals, um, and they show how those goals are essentially set and how that relates to, to peer performance. Council Member Briggs, did you have another comment? No, I don't, sorry, a little in my hand. Others? So um, I'd like to gauge people's thinking on the matter. Um, if there is at least general support for a resolution of this type, then I would offer with the support of Council Member Briggs and Council Member Redina, working off the final version I think of the Environmental Commission, which already took into account um, some of uh, some of the concerns that have been expressed uh, and which I agree with, um, that I propose a, an updated version of the resolution um, that maybe focuses more on energy and climate related issues and takes into account, like I said, some of the other, other related uh, concerns that have been brought up, including those um, from Commissioner Smith, and that I bring that back to our next meeting. How does that sound? Or put it this way, um, does anybody object to that approach, or would they like to amend that proposal? If you re, uh, have a, a different um, proposed process, speak up. <laughs> Yes, Commissioner Peck. I just want to say go for it. Good. So that is what I will do. Um, so you have now um, a lot of information. You have a very old and original version of the uh, resolution. You have the one that at least was posted to Legistar, but I don't think was complete. Um, so you have some of that history, you can read through that, and then we will provide um, something that is reworked, that's hopefully even more succinct and more on target um, for your consideration than uh, in our next meeting. Very good. Thanks for your input and thanks for your guidance. So if I can find my agenda here. Um, the last point um, is a discussion on um, natural gas and new construction. And um, what I would like to do is um, have Joe and I discuss this. It's also been discussed um, between Joe and with input um, from Missy. Originally, there was uh, a proposal um, for a resolution addressing this. And uh, we decided rather than considering the resolution um, that there may, may be a better uh, let's say course of action on this. And I'd like Joe to introduce that. And then I may add some additional comments and then we'll open it up for discussion. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I've mentioned this, uh, but just wanted to have it here. Um, so as many of you know, um, next month, uh, February 14th, uh, the planning commission, they're having their special work session dedicated to the proposed ordinance change that would require all new buildings be electric. Um, my understanding is the agenda for this meeting is still still being put together, but the Planning Commission would welcome having uh, everyone here, the members of the Energy Commission, attend as participants to learn from the various speakers there. Um, given that this meeting date and time, uh, they I think they start at seven or we start at, at, at six, um, overlaps with our February meeting. Uh, we have a couple routes we could go with that. Um, one of the options being canceling our meeting next month. Um, and instead having all energy commissioners attend as participants uh, for that planning session or potentially having a reduced session where we you know still meet for our first hour and then uh, or with the commitment that we finish with that hour and then head over at that point in time. Um, for either of those two options, um, 
that way, all you energy commissioners can both listen and learn from the presenters, uh, but also have the opportunity to call in during the public comment to share feedback, uh, if you desire that, with the Planning Commission. Um, in just overall context, given this tight timeline uh, for the ordinance coming uh, through planning, um, it's my understanding it will not be coming to the Energy Commission before a formal vote by the Planning Commission. Um, however, it will be coming to the Energy Commission after it has cleared planning and before it goes to City Council. Um, there's a lot of moving parts here. I know that um, there's a lot kind of to keep track of. Um, but from talking with uh, Planning Commission folks um, and their their uh, planning staff, joining the meeting on uh, next month, February 14th, seems to be the best way to kind of keep uh, Planning Commission and Energy Commission in alignment. Um, so now we'll just kind of open it up, go through talk a uh, little bit about kind of the process, um, you know, discuss our options and then decide kind of how we want to handle our next meeting um, and kind of uh, go through those different options, see what kind of works best for all of you. Um, John, anything I missed or you would like to add in? Uh, let's just go ahead and open things up for discussion. I've got a few thoughts that I might share later, but um, I'd like to hear what other people think. Commissioner McKenna. You're muted still. Thanks. I'm wondering if we could open up a discussion about what the best, first of all, I wanna put my support in for supporting this meeting and, and going to the planning commission meeting. I think that's a, a great idea. Um, you know, it's, it's really coincident um, topics and, and desires that we have both to focus on the natural gas ban, so I support that. Um, but I want to kind of uh, move the discussion, um, if we may, after hearing from others, towards um, how best to participate in that meeting. Um, I'm not sure right now that calling in as a participant and having this like one way, you know, stand up at the mic, so to speak, and and speak um, is the right, I guess the way to provide the most helpful support. Um, or just you know, being kind of an expert in this topic, I, I'd love to have a back and forth if possible. And so, could I propose that maybe um, we propose to the planning commission? If if anybody, I'm curious to hear if anybody thinks this is a good idea, but maybe um, do it like as a presentation, like there's a an agenda meet an agenda um, element for us um, to kind of have like an open conversation where we are present at the meeting as, as if a presenter would be, um, and then do it that way. I will say just as as some background, we've we've had a couple of discussions with the the planning staff um, about kind of some of the different options and kind of this is this is where they've landed at the moment of just based on everything else that they have packed into that time. Um, I'm more than happy to kind of have further discussions to see if there's there's other options. But this is kind of where where they've come um, at the moment. Um, but always, you know, as always, open to hearing more from others. Um, and if there's overwhelming, you know, support can definitely reach out back and see if there's um additional options there. So Joe, I think for everybody's benefit, certainly for mine and apparently also for Claire's, I'd like to understand what it means that we would participate as participants. So for everybody else's um, edification, planning commission meets in purpose or in person. So if we are participating as participants, um, does that mean we attend in person? Does that mean we dial in like we're doing now and provide public comment potentially at the beginning of the end and participate in no other fashion. Joe, I think you saw a list of about eight questions that I posed to Shannon Gibrano, who is chair, and to Brett um, Little, who is the staff liaison, asking for specific clarification because it's at least important to me that if we are going to cancel our meeting and cancel our business, I want to make sure there's value add versus, let's say, the alternative of us all watching a videotape of their meeting and having our own meeting and then using um, our reactions to watching the videotape to provide input then when it comes to um, energy commission. So I'm, I'm, I'm personally very conflicted on us making a decision tonight about what we sacrifice in terms of our meeting and our agenda items without knowing really what our 
participate what the rules of participation are so if you can illuminate those a little bit more closely and more detailed i would appreciate it and maybe i'll let uh commissioner peck speak first before turning it back to you joe go ahead commissioner peck you know i'd be happy to hear joe say something first but i um but i also just to get it in quick is I think it's very important for us to have a very thoughtful discussion of this topic. You know, we're gonna, planning is going to have one perspective. Uh, we're going to be focused on the climate emergency and the climate crisis, um, and hopefully, there's going to be some good overlap in our our uh, sense of what needs to be done. But we really need to make sure that we're coming at this from all angles in a very thoughtful way. So, I love your idea of just watching their. Uh, proceedings in their talks. I want to learn more for sure. Uh, and then having a thoughtful discussion. But Joe might have a better solution. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, Councilmember Briggs, do you want me to go first or do you have something on this as well? Sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Kind of like you were saying, uh, Chair Mirsky, it would primarily be, yeah, as participant means you'd either be attending uh, the session in person you're able to watch and call in as well um but yeah it would be more in the context of providing input through you know the public comment three minute um you know opportunity there it would not you know being in being in the full group everyone kind of part of that discussion collaborating back and forth in that context um just again that's kind of where you know we weren't necessarily able to get together that whole joint kind of meeting where everyone's talking like that just given time frames with everything planning and to work through on their end um as and just you know getting the timelines from that perspective um so that is kind of that is the context of what it it would be is you know sitting there attending obviously you could you're able to watch it back um but watching it back the you know the only downside to that is you're not able to provide the comment during the time period um others won't hear it um you know either be it community members uh commissioners at the moment um so that that is what would potentially be lost um if we're not directly there um but from the rest of it yeah it would just be those those comments during those those three minute windows where you're able to call in or speak um if uh physically present so that that, that that's clear if we were to have our own meeting we should all recognize that we would not be able to call in certainly at the beginning of their meeting because we would be in the midst of ours. There is the potential that we could call in at the end of the meeting and provide contact uh, suggestions, but that would be um, without having had the benefit of being able to listen into to their meeting. So um, that that's one something we have to to weigh. Um, Council Member Briggs. Yeah, so I was just looking at, um, it looks like, it, if I'm looking at the dates correctly on this, and please correct me if I'm wrong on this, Joe, it, if it's conflicting with ours next month, that's February 14th, the second Tuesday of the month, which is usually when they have a work session, As a, is this coming to a work session or a general session yeah. of theirs? They're okay. having a work session for it. Okay. And so their work sessions are on Zoom still. Um, so it would be possible for everybody to re attend remotely. I think one of the pieces that might be helpful and perhaps more beneficial for this group is if, obviously, if there, there may be balancing a lot on their agenda, I assume, and trying to not make this be too unwieldy. Um, if there was an opportunity to have that, that discussion at the beginning of their agenda, um, for example, um, you know, maybe there are some there are some general comments that members of this commission might want to make at the beginning in public comment to inform their discussion going into it um, and things to think about. But I but I do wonder if it's more helpful. One of the benefits of everybody watching this at the same time, as opposed to saying, "Oh, we're going to go back and watch it," because I know from experience that often doesn't happen. <laughs> um, you know, making a commitment to all watch it is that we all have the same body of information. Um, you are, it then informs the recommendation, the energy commission discussion. So you, what we would have is not so much that planning commission is being informed by energy commission, but that energy commission is being informed by planning commission. And we're able to take into account, you know, what are the things that they're debating? Um, and, helping council wrestle through 
Um, there may be some very different perspectives. I suspect there are some very different perspectives and issues that are going to be brought up. Um, and to be able to hear what those things are, um, you know, even if, you know, the first meeting is the first hour is, is listening to planning commission debate that, and then coming here and, and doing a brain dump of, um, you know, what did we just hear? What was problematic? What was, what made sense? Um, and then helping that inform the a future energy commission discussion. Um, that's one possible possible route that might be productive in terms of just making sure that when this gets to council that we've had a really thoughtful analysis of how this goes forward and maybe identifying what information we don't yet have, um, which is something that I suspect that I'm going to be wrestling with a lot. Great input. I, I'd remind everyone that planning commission is in a sense advising council on this, just as we would be advising council. So we would have the opportunity to weigh in and advise planning commission by participating and providing comment. Um, and then we would have a second, let's say opportunity when we discuss it and we perhaps frame our own resolution to also then advise council. So I, I, I appreciate those comments, council member Briggs. Council member, or excuse me, commissioner Levin. Uh, yeah, I mean, depending on who the speakers are, and I apologize, I haven't looked to see who's speaking at this meeting, but um, it would at least be nice. I don't know if we can designate one person who would be able, whoever we think would be best, maybe to be able to at least ask some questions, asking those at the very end during public comments. I, I don't know that that's going to be the most productive. So I, I get the logistics of you know, we're not going to be panelists. I know we did have that one meeting a long time ago where we did a joint meeting with them about another ordinance. And that's, I guess this is different, but um, I don't know if it's possible to move the timing of when they do their, I mean, it's their meeting, but having the public comments more in line with one of uh, the speakers or being able to have one person that could ask some questions that uh, might be helpful. I, I assume we're not having these same speakers when it comes before us. So I guess that's just my my biggest concern is being able to have some thoughtful questions, even if we, we're not conversing directly with uh, the, the planning commission. Um, but yeah. Thanks for those thoughtful ideas. Um, Commissioner Smith. Yeah, it's um, what I'm hearing from other commissioners and kind of echoing my, my own thoughts here. I just would like to ask, since I didn't hear it directly in the options, is there a pathway forward by which we could have a joint meeting so that it could be a two-way dialogue, a more collaborative discussion and uh, ultimately resolution? I guess my concern is kind of coming out of it with uh, two different perspectives of which, both of which will be valuable, but perhaps, um, you know, uh, being conflicting in nature and being able to have that dialogue and discussion being very important to the ultimate recommendations and, and resolution that go to council. Um, so even if it's a little bit further out in terms of timeline, hearing that that may be part of the issue, Joe, is there a pathway for it? I'd just like to ask on having a, a joint discussion. Um, I think it seems difficult at this time, um, largely because I know, and going back to some of earlier conversations, like the the time to get this done and implemented, um, you know, some of this has already been pushed back a few months, and then once you know everything were to go forward, be voted on, and then go into place, um, does take time as well. So if we were to you know try to get something scheduled, it would kind of further push back the overall timeline and be you know that which is just a trade off to make. Um, it seems like at the moment this is. You know, this is kind of the path forward that they they are working for. They originally were looking at this in the what their December meeting, and they you know postponed it to voting in their March meeting, um, with you know February being the work session, and then the months of December and January being time to gather as much information as they could from the planning staff side as well as others in recognition of a lots of people were in and out throughout the holidays. Um, so I, you know, it is certainly possible to ask and see if something like that could happen. 
Um, but it seems like it would be difficult um, to do given the given the timeline because again their 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 timeline is have their work session in February, vote on their um, recommendation in March. At which point it would then you know go through you know we'd have opportunity to have um, you know look over that provide our own recommendations uh, before going to council is my understanding. I'll speak up and give my opinion here. Um, I, I second the concerns or the desire, maybe is a better way of putting it, that Commissioner Smith expressed. On the other hand, um, we we do have an acute need for new housing um, in, in Ann Arbor, and the Planning Commission and City Council is really working valiantly to address that. Um, and there are a number of projects. Any of you who follow M Live probably saw Ryan Stanton's recent argue, uh, article at the end of December, I think it was, listing 30 projects in Ann Arbor that are in process. Um, some are in construction, but others are proposed. Several of those proposals are involve hundreds of units of new um, housing and those housing um, units in some several of the cases would be would be fired by or hooked up to natural gas so if we stretch out this discussion too long then we risk more and more units potentially being approved or going ahead that are going to be hooked up to natural gas so we have to weigh um, acting on this and this has been something frankly that's been discussed for a couple of years going back to um, how to try to influence the state's energy code and that didn't work then looking at whether or not we could um, take a different a novel interpretation of the energy code um, that did not well let's say was not viewed favorably by by legal then this new idea came up of addressing it through zoning um, we feel that our legal feels that, and as does planning and everybody else, I think that that has um, pretty strong support and foundation based on, on health related reasons. And so um, there's a lot of history on this topic. I would work with Joe and planning to share some of that with you so that when we go into this, we have a better understanding of what's been considered up to up till now. and how many months and indeed years have, have, have led to this. Um, so those are those are thoughts that I wanted everybody to to consider and wanted to share with you. Others um, before we maybe take a vote on on what we do in our meeting. Any other comments? So I'm going to weigh in with my recommendation. My recommendation is that we cancel our meeting. I think this is an important topic. I would encourage all of, and we'll put this up for a vote, um, but I would encourage everyone to attend the meeting in person or at the very least to dial in. I would encourage everyone to read some preparatory materials that we'll pull together so that you understand the background. And I would encourage everyone to provide public comment at the beginning and maybe even ideally at the end if you want to react to something that was discussed and then we will all have an opportunity to uh, discuss this in in our own meeting to prepare our own resolution and to address any concerns that we have before council um, finally votes on this that that would be my recommendation um, to the group um, and what i would like to do is um, allow anybody else to maybe make their final recommendations or, or speak and then i'll take a vote on whether or not uh, we will hold the uh the meeting or not um, but any other final thoughts from anyone else so i'm going to make a resolution or frame a uh, uh a motion that we cancel our meeting in February 14th and that we all make our best efforts to join the planning commission meeting as outlined by Joe. Um, is there a second to that motion? 
second from Commissioner Peck. Um, so I'd like to put it to a vote. Um, all those in favor of canceling our meeting and joining the Planning Commission meeting, please say aye and raise your hand. Aye. Aye. All those opposed? And any abstentions? So I think it passed unanimously. Um, so with that, um, we will join um, the meeting. And remember, that's at 7 o'clock. We will make sure that we get out um, the meeting particulars, um, the link, and so on and so forth. Um, and we'll also get out some materials to you um, for your consideration. Um, one thing that um, I will tell you in advance that um, I'm working on um, with the support of Ken Garber. Ken Garber, some of you may know, has put together a list of um, development projects um, that have been approved already since the approval of A20 and whether or not they're hooked up to natural gas. I asked him to update that based on Ryan Stanton's um, article. Um, he's uh, given me a draft of that. It's 43 development projects. Um, it lists um, some of the key characteristics of the project, um, whether it's proposed to hook up to natural gas or not, or whether it's it's unknown. <laughs> and that will be one of the things um, that we'll forward to you so that you can see um, what is at least um, already been approved since the A20 plan was approved and then what's in the pipeline. Um, and then, like I said, we'll also try to get you some summary level information about some of the other actions that have been taken um, by the city with other parties to try to affect, um, let's say, more sustainable construction um, and why we are at the place where we are and what specifically the proposal is relative to zoning so that you can read, on, uh, read up on that before the meeting on the 14th. Okay, so we are, um, over the hill, I think, and, and sliding down towards uh, bringing this to adjournment, we have remaining um, OSI reports, as well as news um, from commissioners. Um, Joe, you want to kick us off first? Sure. Um, and just to give two logistic commission things before the overall OSI reports. One, um, I know some folks have been having difficulties receiving emails um, from the Energy Commission group. Um, Obviously, I don't know if people are not receiving them, um, and you might not either. So if you haven't been receiving emails recently from that would be sent to the Energy Commission, the most recent one would have been this morning, um, please reach out, um, and I can work with IT just to make sure that you all are getting those emails. Um, and additionally, um, I think I, I think I sent out at one point, but relatedly, some might not have gotten. Um, our meetings will be held virtually for the rest of this year. Um, if that is changing at any point, I will reach out and let you know. But for the time being, plans are for all of our meetings this year to be uh, virtual as well. Um, Commissioner Harp, did you have a question on either of those? Yeah, sorry. Just just for quick awareness about how many emails may have been sent out recently so that <laughs> one might know <laughs> if, if whether they're having a problem or not. Sure. Admittedly, not a ton. Most have just been around the agenda has been posted or a quick update around that. Um, I believe the most recent one would have been, but well, I know I sent one last Wednesday at 341. Um, and there should the have been one was the transparency resolution email. So if any of you did not get that email, let Joe know because then we would know that was sent out Joe when um, was it actually this morning? Yes. Yeah. Let me, I think it would have been, yeah, this morning around 941 would All have right. been the most recent. So either this morning at 941 or last Wednesday at like three something in the afternoon. So yeah, not a ton, but they're mostly just around here's agenda has been posted, any changes or other little updates as they come. Um, Outside of that, things are moving forward at OSI. Uh, like we mentioned, our all our budget stuff is due to city administrator by the end of the month. So a bit of a lot of work has been done just kind of around our respective programs and stuff like that, getting those budgets prepared. Um, we also just put out our, our newsletter. I think it went out yesterday or something. So feel free to peruse that to see any any things that have been updated. Just a couple, couple highlights. Um, 
Joe, can uh, I ask yeah, that go ahead. you double check the mailing list of that and ensure that all commissioners are on it? Actually, I'm not positive that I'm even on it. Um, I read it, but uh, I think I read it because someone sent me the link and I don't know that I got the link uh, or the email uh, or the announcement um, um, directly from OSI. So I think all commissioners should be getting that. For the newsletter you're saying? Yes. Yep, yes. I can. Okay, I can check in on that. Great. Um, and yeah, if if you're not, uh, there's, it's on our website. It is our website, which is sometimes difficult to navigate. So fully understanding uh, that aspect. But yeah, it comes out. I think we're moving towards doing it once a month instead of bi-monthly or every other month. Um, yeah, a couple, couple quick highlights. Um, this was put out a little bit ago, but um, Ann Arbor has once again been named a climate action leader on the CDP A list. Uh, so we're one of 122 cities that received an A rating on that. Um, obviously still more work to go, but still good to be kind of, um, kind of there. Um, several programs are moving forward. Uh, a couple of things we've been looking at are um, Solarize in a commercial setting with the 2030 district. Um, so some work is being put towards that. Um, and that is kind of one of the, the main things as well as just general strategic planning with everything that's kind of been, been going on. Um, more detail in the, um, in the newsletter. Um, also, as we mentioned last time, Energy Concierge, there's a pilot going this spring. Uh, report will be um, later this year. Um, those are kind of some of the main things lot more detail in the newsletter. So please check that out if you're more interested or feel free to uh, ask any questions here. Updates from uh, council members and commissioners. Council member Briggs. I can't think of a update right now, but I'm gonna use this opportunity to to say what I might think, uh, just to talk a little bit more about the February um, meeting. It, one thing that obviously planning commission will be thinking about a lot is the impact of a natural gas ban on, on all types of development. Um, and so we often talk a lot about housing, but I know that they're going to be thinking a lot about what does this mean for industrial? What does it mean for labs? You know, like just the whole scope of a uh, of different type of development. Um, we are beginning as council members to, to hear from different types of developers that are saying, you know, I, um, you know, ha I cannot build a, a large scale hotel, for example, in Ann Arbor. Um, if, uh, if you do something like this, I, you know, we're not seeing models of this. And so to the degree that folks have um, information and, and expertise to be able to inform this conversation, that conversation around different types of development and different things that planning commission should be thinking about in this process. Um, I think that would be really helpful for them and obviously ultimately helpful for, for council. But those are some of the questions I can anticipate they might be thinking about. Thank you. Commissioner Peck. Hey, I'm wondering if Claire is hiding somewhere. Uh, Cause I have a funny feeling you would have an answer to some of these questions or at least know who to go to. Can you envision someone, you know, some type of development, a big hotel? Uh, I think a University of Michigan will figure out a way to do it without gas if we built something big. So I, I don't, I, I think that that would be one part of the answer. But is it reasonable that a developer could say, "Hey, you're just making it impossible to do this"? Um, I don't think so anymore. But you might have a better answer. Is it okay if I answer or would... Go ahead. Thanks. Um, yeah, not to get too long-winded here, but I worked on projects <laughs> in Boston that were uh, basically the city of Boston, you know, as an engineer on the developers team, the city of Boston asked us the same question. Um, here's a new, new hotel that you're proposing, like what proved to us that it can't be all electric. That was kind of their stance. Um, and so I've done the engineering analysis on the development team um, and we basically weren't able to prove it, <laughs> um, right? Cause like the technology is available and it's just a matter of uh, cost and sure the developers are talking about their bottom line when they say that they can't do it. Um, but I guarantee you that there are developers in this country um, on, uh, on the East and on the West and in other parts of the country that are doing it today. And if you're talking to a developer that says they can't do it then they need to move on 
because there's somebody else that can. Thanks. Wait, they can go to that's Texas. Effect, that's effectively what what uh, Tim McDonald told us. Certainly, on you know on the housing <laughs> side, uh, and and you know commercial kitchens can use um, induction um, and electric cooking just like residential units can. Um, other other comments, uh, updates from commissioners. Anything else? Well, I, I will again um, offer a brief comment. Um, I don't know if you have seen um, that uh, it's now generally estimated that 2022 um, greenhouse gas emissions in the United States rose, what I wrote down, 1.3%. Um, they're almost back to pre-pandemic levels. Uh, Apparently GDP rose, so on the uh, emissions at, at per GDP dropped slightly, which is good news, but we're not worried about relative um, emissions, we're worried about absolute emissions. So the curve that we're on is certainly not something that we can be happy about. And relative to what we'll be talking about with the planning commission, certainly on the housing side, and um, then, you know, we're, some, treat some of these other issues like labs and things like that, hopefully differently. But what was interesting is that housing and building related emissions were up 6% over the prior year. So overall emissions were up 1.3% and housing and building related emissions are up 6%. So we obviously need to do something. And I think that's what we're all grappling with and we'll talk about in the week. That's the one thing that I wanted to um, to share. And by the way, I think when we talk about this, I recognize that our discussion on the 14th is going to be focused primarily, if not almost exclusively, on a natural gas ban. But I would offer to all of us and to council that this is just the beginning. Um, we've talked about um, energy efficiency and, for example, passive house construction. Um, that's not going to be a part of this ban. Um, and we know that if a building is energy inefficient, for example, the envelope is leaky or poorly insulated, that you're, you're, even if it's powered by renewable energy, then all of your systems have to be bigger. Um, all the solar power and renewable energy that's generated has to be more. All of that has embodied energy. So this big, this issue is a lot bigger than just um, being all electric or a natural gas ban. Um, and that's something that I think we'll want to talk about on the 14th or later. Um, Commissioner Peck, you're muted. We don't, I don't want to be contentious, but I think on that issue, when we were doing the carbon neutrality plan for U of M, we did a lot of analysis and it was concluded, and, and this is where Greg Keolian could come in handy maybe, that it's not efficient to focus on energy efficiency relative to renewable energy. In other words, um, from a cost point of view, dollars, you know, carbon per unit car or carbon per dollar, hmm. it's better to go with renewable energy rather than spend money on uh, energy efficiency in university buildings. Um, and we're still going to do some, you know, obviously we're going to build these new buildings that we're now building since we passed that carbon neutrality plan are going to be very, very efficient. But um, in terms of retrofitting, it might not be the most cost effective way. Now, Claire is going to tell you how I'm wrong. No. <laughs> Go ahead, Claire. That is that grit. Um yeah, I just want to kind of add a little bit of nuance to that. I think for um, commercial buildings and 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 um, university buildings, that makes sense. You know, you have more, um, you don't have as high heating demands. Um, but for a heating dominated climate and heating dominated use, what we think of residential, um, actually energy efficiency is the number one uh, step we have to take. And that's because it enables, um, you know, all electric heating with heat pumps. And so um, I, and I know that we mentioned earlier, um, several commissioners mentioned earlier that, you know, we want to focus on the highest, um, you know, greenhouse gas emission savings maybe for cost. 
Um, but I would also kind of warn against that. Um, I think that that's a mentality that worked earlier, um, but now we have to dig into the nitty gritty of what the phasing is um, of some of these more complicated changes. So I know that's a big topic for right now um, towards the end of the meeting, but I just wanted to kind of put that in. Thanks. So um, we're then on to um, working group updates and report from the Environmental Commission. Carlene is in here. I don't think the transportation electrification group is, has met, so I don't think there's any update there. On the Environmental Commission side, um, I already mentioned that um, um, two of the most recent meetings really focused on, on this um, transparency um, resolution and um, uh, we didn't have a meeting in December. We we're having a special meeting in uh, on Thursday to set topics um, for this year. And that's going to be in addition to our regular meeting at the end of the month. So I'll be able to um, provide more insights in our next meeting. Uh, we're now back to public input. So uh, let's see. This is, again, an opportunity for persons to speak for up to three minutes. Um, if you're watching on CTN, please call 888-788-0099 or 877-853-5247 and enter meeting ID 956-8718-7876. This information is also displayed on the agenda and the video feed. City staff will select uh, callers that have raised their hand one by one using the last three digits of your phone number to electronically raise your hand uh, to indicate your desire to speak. Please press star nine on your phone. You will hear an automated message that the host is allowing you to speak. And when please, uh, or please move to a quiet area when speaking. And then finally, again, state your name and your address at the beginning of your comments. Um, I have caller, let me give you permission. Um, caller ending in 010. Uh, good evening again. This is Wayne Appleyard, uh, 5750 Prospect Hill Road, Grass Lake, Michigan. Um, and former energy commissioner, just quickly, a couple of things. I think John's right that, uh, you need to try and use the charts that are in the, um, climate action plan or in the 820 plan, uh, for prioritizing. The problem is the charts are faulty. The charts don't have numbers for a lot of the items. And so, for instance, if you use the chart for green rental housing, no money would be spent because it's not calculated. Uh, and uh, the same is for uh, the Energy Concierge, concierge and uh, Community Education. So uh, some work needs to be done on that. And some of those numbers, I don't think I would necessarily agree with. So I think somebody needs to check those items. Um, I think someone talked about the uh, possible uh, legislation on banning, banning natural gas. I think that's dead now that the energy, the uh, Democrats have taken over, at least I certainly hope so, at the state level. Um, someone mentioned the problem with uh, people replacing their units only when they fail. And we need to teach people that if you wait for something to fail, then you don't have the option of getting the right thing because it may not be around, especially uh, considering um, there are sometimes um, time lags for getting things like heat pumps, especially uh, particularly good ones. Um, and finally, uh, I've been hearing that the website is being been is being redone for well over a year, and <laughs> I think uh, that uh, tells us something about the process and the ability to uh, have good websites. And I think that the um, city should reconsider uh, using an outboard website for the web portion of the energy concierge and i'll quit with that thank you thank you anyone else joe yep 
Um, caller ending in one three four. Yes, thanks. This is Ken Garber again. Um, very fertile discussion. Really appreciate the thoughtfulness everyone brought to it tonight. Um, just a quick comment, hopefully helpful, on other building types besides housing when it comes to feasibility for full electrification. Um, yeah, I appreciate uh, Commissioner McKenna's remarks on hotels. Yeah, it's ridiculous to say that a uh, hotel can't do without gas. Plenty of examples of those around the country um, at this point. Uh, restaurants, obvious. Uh, I think Councilmember Briggs mentioned labs. Yes, these are difficult. The problem there is that, um, you know, they employ fume hoods that require um, very frequent air exchange um, for safety reasons. And um, so this issue came up during the Sartorius debate last year. And um, I, I did some research into this. I don't expect, I don't say I'm the expert. I'm sure Commissioner Overpeck knows far more than I do. Um, but there are several innovations now available to reduce fume hood airflow so that the need for a constant air exchange is minimized. Uh, these allow major energy savings. They can't all be used in all situations, but if they're built into the building design, they can really reduce its energy use and the need for constant air exchange and heating. Um, we know it's possible to do this because such lab buildings are now going up. I'm on, there's the Integrated Science Center at Carleton College in Minnesota, which employs geothermal. Another example is the Integrative Genomics Building at the Lawrence Berkeley Natural, National Lab, which uses a heat recovery chiller and air source heat pump. And I'm sure U of M experts are grappling with this uh, as we speak. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm still mourning the fact that we allowed Sartorius to go forward with gas, but I think that can be the last one. Um, so that's my last comment. Again, I really appreciate um, the uh, expertise, thoughtfulness, and passion that everyone's bringing to this whole subject. Thank you, Mr. Garber. I appreciate, and we appreciate your comments as well, and I appreciate all the commissioners' input and comments tonight. Uh, with that, we're on to our second or basically our last agenda item, which is uh, items for our next agenda. We've already decided our next meeting will be in March, um, not in February. Um, we've just discussed uh, in your, the December work session what the topics will be for discussion. Is there anything to add to that or are we pretty well set? Does any, was something overlooked um, that somebody's recognized since the December meeting? Any other additional suggestions? I'll note one thing. Um, we were potentially going to have someone talk about uh, the dams in February. Um, so I'll see what would be a time that works best for them if if March works cool, but I'll, I'll see what availability they have. Great, thanks. Anything else? Seeing none, uh, I... Uh, adjourn this meeting at 8.29 p.m. Um, thanks to all of you uh, and have a nice rest of your evening.